and welcome to the Open Technology Institute. My name is Sasha Meinrath. I direct the Open Technology Institute and I'm vice president here. And I feel very privileged to have an outstanding group of folks who will entertain and astound you with their wealth of information today. Uh, OTI sort of has three different areas that we work in, spanning community and field operations, policy wonky work, and technological development. And I feel like they're well represented here. We have everything from Rebecca and her work on the Netizen Project, collecting a lot of information. Uh, we've got an open internet tools project. We've got Ben Scott, who came out of the State Department and is now holding down our, our work in the EU. And of course, we have Gene's team. And it's to Gene I want to point your attention. This gentleman right here will be emceeing the rest of the event. He's a truly remarkable individual. Uh, he was VP at Consumers Union, did a stint at the US DOJ, working on antitrust at a time when the AT&T T-Mobile merger, one of the largest mergers in telecom history, perhaps the largest, was pending before that very body. Uh, he spent time as chief counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee, was legislative director at the Consumer Federation of America. All this coming out of a long stint, maybe a decade or so, at Public Citizens Congress Watch. So he has been a veteran in these spaces, fighting the good fight for many, many years. And so when he first approached me with this notion of creating an internet freedom and human rights project here at the Open Technology Institute, I can only say I was utterly thrilled to have him in the mix. His vast expertise, his wisdom, a lot of his geopolitical acumen Having that in the mix has really been transformative and wonderful. And so I'm really glad to see him then reaching out and bringing in another cadre of experts to add into this space and to be working on ramping up a number of new initiatives and interventions through that work. So I'm particularly excited to have you here and am seeing this event. I'm also particularly excited to have Frank LaRue and Carolina, Cynthia, and um, and Rebecca uh, here as well. I'm going to turn it over to you now uh, to introduce our speakers in more depth and grab one of the few remaining seats here uh, in this space and look forward to what's about to transpire. Thanks. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, New America. Thank you to everyone in the audience for coming out on this lovely day. Um, I want to particularly thank Sarah Bern Hudgens, my assistant, who helped put this together along with Carolina Rossini. More about her in a minute. Um, and my colleagues at Global Partners Digital in London, who can't be here today, uh, but who helped galvanize the ideas behind this. Um, we're really honored to host Frank LaRue, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. And more about Frank in a minute. I'd like to first introduce my colleagues here who are going to lead off some of the questioning and commentary. Uh, before we turn it to you in the audience and those online who can tweet using the hashtag Q for LaRue, Q as in the letter, for the number, L-A-R-U-E. First, our guest, Cynthia Wong. Cynthia is a rising star in the movement. She's at Human Rights Watch now, focusing on internet and human rights with a vast knowledge of technology from her days running the Center for Democracy and Technology's project on global internet freedom. We have Rebecca McKinnon here at New America, author of the fabulous book, Consent of the Networked, who is now putting the world's most powerful technology and communications companies under a human rights microscope in her ranking digital rights project, something over time you're going to hear quite a bit more about. And last but not least, Carolina Rossini, uh, who is running our Latin America Resource Center uh, for Global Partners and New America. Carolina is a brilliant Brazilian lawyer, veteran of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and currently coordinating work with NGOs across Latin America who care about human rights and the internet. So why in the world would we have invited Frank LaRue here? Well, 
as all of you know, there's been an unbelievably furious debate about surveillance and monitoring over the last few weeks, focused substantially around the U.S., around the U.S. Constitution, laws, uh, the impact on citizens here, residents here, led by wonderful groups like the ACLU, Free Press has jumped in, a whole variety of national security NGOs, CDT. But what about all of those law-abiding citizens around the world whose calls, emails, web activities have been implicated by surveillance and monitoring? What about them? Well, a few weeks ago, uh, my colleagues at Global Partners Digital and a broad coalition of uh, informally gathered NGOs describing themselves as best bits brought together more than 150 human rights organizations and NGOs around the world raising significant questions about whether the United States, multinational corporations, and other countries have violated human rights principles. As we speak, Privacy International, Access, the Electronic Frontier Foundation are starting to circulate a set of surveillance principles that I'm sure all of you will be hearing quite a bit more about in the coming days and weeks. And I know on Thursday the Center for Democracy and Technology is hoping a deeper discussion about the implications under international law of all these surveillance and monitoring activities. So it is this global perspective that we wanted to highlight, and we're fortunate that Frank was available to visit with us. He's here for a very, very simple reason, besides the fact that he's so generous with his time. Frank has been dedicated for more than 25 years to fighting for human rights, starting with creating and leading a human rights group in Guatemala, and then most recently, and probably most importantly for our endeavors today, serving as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, where he has single-handedly galvanized interest in human rights and the Internet through his landmark reports on freedom of expression, surveillance, and privacy. So we welcome Frank to give us insight from all of this work and to provide your views on how human rights principles are necessary to address these recent revelations about surveillance and monitoring. Welcome, Frank. Well, thank you, Gene. Um, and I thank all the organizations that had put uh, efforts in, in this meeting and this event. Uh, the best thing for a rapporteur is to see that a report presented to the Human Rights Council or to the Third Committee of the General Assembly actually gets discussed and it actually provokes some degree of reflection and, and deeper thoughts uh, of everyone and it can actually be developed by other uh, individuals and organizations. So the more we can debate these reports and these issues, uh, the better we feel about the work we do. There's nothing worse than, than having a report and seeing it go by in silence. Um, let me say, as Jean was mentioning, that Mm, the reports of the rapporteurs mention different countries and examples, and we mention our country visits, but, but you also pick a topic per year to have kind of highlight certain issues in regards to specific rights. And the idea of a, of a, of a rapporteur is to try to introduce new elements into the definition of rights or into the discussion of these rights. So in 2011, I presented my first report on Internet and Freedom of Expression to the Human Rights Council in June. You can find it in the website of the High Commissioner, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And then in the General Assembly, I did a follow-up uh, for, for the, same, the same topic, but with new, with new information and new ideas. And basically what I was trying to say, and this was an ongoing debate, is that Internet is a new technology with new challenges, and new dangers, very serious dangers as well. But 
doesn't necessarily bring in the need for establishing new rights. That our classic freedom of expression rights, Articles 19 and 20 of the ICCPR or 13 of the American Convention of Human Rights are still valid. The principles are the same, except that every time you have a new technology, that new technology will challenge the interpretation of those principles and how we apply them, or will challenge the responsibility in which we work. We'll put new challenges to the media and to ethics and professionalism. This is what I was trying to say there. There was a couple of debates going on in the UN, which I wanted to address. Um, number one is the impact of, of internet around the world and what it does in terms of stereotyping. The, some countries wanted me to include the concept of defamation or religion. Mm, this was right after I came, became rapporteur in August of 2008 and was right after the cartoons, the Danish cartoons came out, which I, I think uh, were mm, relatively mishandled in terms of the way to explain them. Uh, I was forced to defend the cartoons, and I always will, because that is a form of expression, and a form of expression with a certain degree of mockery, which is legitimate. But I do think there is a difference in, in handling things appropriately or just letting them go. It was very important for me to define that defamation of religion does not exist. Um, defamation itself should be decriminalized, and it's only something related to individuals and not to religions, ideologies, schools of thought, or any other way. All this I presented in my report in 2011. But in the General Assembly, more importantly, and this is still a point I'm trying to make today and that I'm actually going to begin sort of with other organizations and, and, and individuals that are interested mapping out, is the question of accessibility. It is very clear that Internet only makes sense if everyone has access and we don't make this the benefit of a small privileged elite uh, whether it be a technological elite or whether it be an economic elite. Of course, everyone disagreed with me at the beginning, especially if I mentioned this in Geneva, of all places in Europe. Finland has 99.5% of, of connectivity. Uh, I think the highest in the world was Iceland. Um, but when you look around the world, and I said, even in the US, if you look on certain regions and states of the US, connectivity is not necessarily accessible to everyone, nor by the cost, nor by the service or the service providers. And certainly, if you're going to the developing nations, less. We used to talk with, with Cynthia on the experience of China. China discovered the power of internet and is growing rapidly in connectivity. But for me, the access to internet was related to content and to connectivity. In China, you have the connectivity and it's growing. The, the country was there. 375 million when I wrote my report, now it's probably many more, but with very little content except that that was approved by the government and the party. In India, for instance, the other way around, very free content, this was in 2011, now there's some regulations they're trying to introduce, but very free and open content, but only 7% of that year, now it's about 10, 10 to 11, maybe 12% connectivity in a country was greatly developed technology. So those were the issues, and we can talk about that if, if, if anyone is interested in the questions. But what were the pitfalls? And this is where people began to ask me, but there's dangers in the internet. And sure enough, last year we had the tragic events of Oslo. So in a way, again, events were forcing me to deal what happens with the power that the internet has of disseminating news so fast but also of making it in an interactive way with all the other mm, forms of communication in the past have been unilinear. You had a communicator sending out a message and many people receiving it. Over here you send a message, but many people receive it, respond, connect between themselves and organize. And that can be used well, can be used wrongly. And clearly was used within the issue of hate speech and we had this tragedy of Oslo, which forced the world to less now rethink our democratic models and where does freedom of expression and where does the internet in particular fall into that. And of course, my position has never been censorship does not solve the issues. There are certain elements of protection. We have to protect children. We have to protect national security, yes, but within very clear boundaries by the law and a very reduced framework of exceptions. Then from that issue of hate speech, which is my report to last year's General Assembly, 
it was inevitable that I had to fall into the question of surveillance and privacy. Why? Because it is happening around the world. I had no idea, by the way, I, I swear, no idea about what was happening, in, nor in the national security, nor in the NSA, or in any other country, for that matter. Uh, I just knew that it was happening, and everyone talked about it, and we related with NGOs around the world that were saying, look, the technology is moving so fast, which is, which is in a way, is great, because it is the way, this, why, this is one of the debates we've had at the IGF, is what about the governance of the internet, which can be the institution governing, and I'm not in favor of sort of easily establishing, even in, the, I'm against the UN sort of general position, and some countries moving into the ITU, I work in the UN system, but I don't believe the ITU would be the right institution at all to, to, to play a role in this. This is a technical institution with other, a different mandate. So again, I believe that this freedom of the internet, the speed which the technology grows and how fast it moves is really one of its, its basic uh, sort of standards of benefit to the world. But at the same time, with the speed, comes the problem of not being able to catch up. So the new technologies can easily be used to create easy alternatives for monitoring. And we began to discover, before this, this was way before the scandals, that what is actually happening, that, phone, that, 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 that the same way the phones were being monitored in the past, now internet communications were being monitored. I remember in, in my own country, people said, ah, if you speak over Skype, Skype cannot be monitored. Everything can be monitored. There's not a single form of communication that cannot be monitored with the new technologies. So what is the rationale of all this? Number one is I say in my report, and I'll give you just two or three elements, and well, this I'll, I'll leave it to the questions. But number one is national security is a legitimate concern, by all means. I don't want to, I'm not playing games with the topic. I don't want to be simplistic. Because I know that there are some people who say, no, no, no. Let's not let people scare us with that. No, I think there is a, a, a danger. And the, the events in Boston prove them. Things do happen. And not only national security is the right of states, more importantly, is the obligation of states. The states have an obligation to protect all individuals, citizens or not, who live in their territory. But that protection has to be done within a democratic framework. Even the ICCPR has regulations for for, for a states of exception. Yes, a country that is being invaded or there is a state of exception for a natural disaster still has certain human rights standards. So it doesn't mean that a danger eliminates all responsibility. And this is what worries me the most. That because there is a serious problem of security, then yes, we can jump all the standards we had. No. I always said to everyone, this, I can even mention this because it was, I said it in the Senate in Thailand, because Thai, I was kind of challenging the less majestal laws in Thailand. They said, you don't understand our history. You don't understand our culture. This is cultural relativism. And I said, this is exactly what I disagree with. Human rights have to be equal around the world. This is what's called universality. Why? Because they're a minimum standard, not a maximum standard. And this is what people forget. Human rights are the minimal elements that every state has to guarantee to protect the life and the dignity of every single human being. And it's that basic network that we're trying to guarantee. And no country can say, oh, look, I'm, I have a different culture, I have a different language, I have a different tradition. In my country, we equip women when they disbehave, or in my country, we have a tradition of beating children so they grow up in a different way. Uh, no, this cannot exist. This is unacceptable. Well, the same argument we can use with monitoring, illegal monitoring of communication, an illegal breach of privacy is not acceptable anywhere in the world. Now, yes, communications can be monitored if there is a criminal investigation, if there is a judge ordering it, if there is judicial supervision, and more importantly, if there is congressional or legislative supervision at the same time. Now, the way that many countries got around it, I mean, some countries, there's one particular country I won't mention, but created, created a tribunal for this purpose, which is the military tribunal for surveillance, they call it. But it's basically to allow blanket surveillance and to guarantee the right of these people. So it's not a case-by-case -case basis, or not even a situation-by-situation -situation basis. One could understand maybe in a certain region, a certain moment, there may be some moment of crisis. No. It's, yes, we will allow of such and such a group of people. 
Now, the problem with this type of surveillance, which can be the, the blanket surveillance, is that it goes behind profiling. And profiling, in a way, in a way, is going back to the old forms of discrimination. Yes, you can talk about profiles, but essentially, and, and I, I shouldn't even mention this in this place because it's no, not relevant to internet, but certainly relevant to the way that we see, we have legal cases like the case in Florida, no? just recently decided, which I think is a big tragedy, where people make a profile, then yes, surveillance is acceptable, then violence is acceptable, then and to see anyone as a potential danger can sort of ultimately allow us to do many things that normally we would, should be restricted from in the protection of basic standard human rights. This was my position, this was the motivation. What is the general conclusion that I make in my report? Number one is that yes, there is a legitimate concern of national security and it should be addressed, I'm not high. <laughs> Secondly, there are other concerns. In Latin America, for us, organized crime is a concern, which includes national security, but also includes other elements. Is the growth of organized crime like a cancer in states that can be overcome by, by organized crime and bought out, judges, members of Congress, anyone. So it is important to, to combat that. It, this has other elements of trafficking of people, of trafficking of children, of sexual exploitation and child abuse and child pornography. Yes, all those things happen and have to be challenged. I work on children's rights in my own country as well. So I understand the dangers. But again, in order to combat those dangers in a way that strengthens our society, we have to establish the due process of law procedures. There has to be, a, like I said, and essentially my recommendation is there has to be a judicial oversight and a legislative oversight. I, I, I focus on the need for both. Some countries only want to have the legislative oversight. That doesn't always work because members of Congress have their own agenda depending on what party, I'm talking about the world in general, depending on what party uh, they, they belong to. So I think yes, there should be an intelligence committee in all Congresses of the world to, to supervise. But there should also be in a specific court procedure so what's important is that the decision should not be made, nor by the executive branch alone in an arbitrary way, much less by security agencies on their own, whether they be police, military, or in general national security intelligence agencies. This is the crucial element. What I'm trying to do as rapporteur, which is my obligation, is to take the arbitrariness from the decision. Because I think many of these things happen with the best of intentions, but if you allow national security agencies to make a decision, if you allow police agencies to make a decision, inevitably, because of their mentality, their logic, inevitably those decisions will lead to some form of abuse. And here's where you, you create a democratic system with checks and balances. This is what it's all about. There's nothing new in what we're doing, except that this time we're applying it to internet and to communications. This was my, my, my report. And what I say at the end of my report, by the way, is that the safest society is the most democratic society. Because what happens is, if a society begins to break down in its own principles, then it begins to crack and create sort of crevices that can actually weaken its own structure and its own state and security. This is what happened to the military regimes in Latin America, where I come from, and what we were able to see. Of course that they were, they were justifying their, their actions by the Cold War. They keep on saying they were defending the Constitution and the nation. In the meantime, they were disappearing people and torturing people, and in my country, committing massacres and genocide. And this is non-acceptable. No excuse can be acceptable, because where does it end? This is the problem. And the reflection, I mean, obviously, in, in many countries is where, where does this lead us? Maybe one last word, and with this I finish, is uh, this, because this is a debate here in the US, is what happens between nationals and foreigners? I mean, because I, I obviously I like the First Amendment and I clearly see that the US has a standard of freedom of expression that goes way beyond the rest of the world. This is true. And there's sort of a, jurisprudence to accompany that it has been well put in place. Sometimes excessively, I mean to the extent that some issues 
like having a Ku Klux Klan be illegal are far beyond what other countries would allow, and certainly what I would allow. But, but, but again, I, I understand here the, the way that this nation was built and the principles around the, the, the communities that came here first made this very important. But the problem is that then, is this valid, is this principle valid of freedom of expression beyond any limits valid only for U.S. citizens and not everyone else around the world? And the same way for the other rights. Is privacy <coughs> different in the U.S. than it should be anywhere else? Or in Britain, where now they discovered that the G8 meeting had also been yeah. monitored. It also actually makes you feel good, because if the heads of state are being monitored, or everyone else can be monitored. <laughs> but, um, but it's absurd. I mean, so then who's going to trust anyone? Yes, and the agents, intelligence agencies share information. Do they really? Do they share all their information? Do they? I mean, this is where the game falls into, you, you, you kind of trip yourself in your own tail, we say in Spanish, you know? Because you, you, you begin sort of going in circles and eventually you fall into the trap of allowing anything to go through. This will inevitably weaken a democratic legal system. And this is the basic principle. Freedom of expression and privacy are two different rights, very distinct rights, but have to go hand in hand. You cannot have full freedom of expression if you don't fully guarantee privacy, because people will be scared. There will be an intimidation to speak, certainly not only in the US, I mean, certainly if you're talking about Syria or Iran or North Korea or any other country, then even worse. I mean, their privacy is a fundamental necessity. So we must keep in our mental sort of concept of, of, of human rights now that we're by the, basically at the 20th anniversary of the Vienna Declaration, why we decided that all rights are equal, all rights are universal, all rights are interdependent and interrelated because they strengthen each other. And this ultimately is what strengthens a democratic society. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, well, I was just thinking through some of the things you were saying, Frank, and I just wanted to pick up one thing that you said at the end there, which is uh, about the universality of rights. And it's one thing I'm struggling with here. Um, when you look at how the US and the UK have defended their laws, uh, they've said, don't worry, we're not spying on non-Americans, or we're not intercepting um, data from people in, in the UK itself. I looked this up, and there's, there's about 2.5 billion users on the internet now, and only about 12% of them are in the US and the UK. Right? And so it's a, it's a big problem in the sense that um, there's all these people who do have a privacy interest. Their data is flowing through the US and sometimes to the UK. A lot of their data is stored in the US. Um, so in the long run, it doesn't really seem like a workable legal theory to say that uh, you really should only protect the rights of people on your soil and no one else. We're only going to become more connected. Um, and so how do we really give meaning to the right to privacy um, uh, under that legal theory that the US and the UK seem to be putting forward? So I'm, I'm kind of curious to get your thoughts on you know, what are the obligations here of these countries to the people outside their country, uh, and, and what should they be? And you're also raising a very important question, which was already raised. I, I, by the way, this report, I, I, uh, I had a great com series of conversations at the State Department. And I must thank the State Department for being very open. And, and I also shared it with them very openly. And this was very good. And I'm, I'm very pleased. But precisely that point came up. And, and, and some people in the legal department were telling me that the law was amended, the Patriots Act, I guess, that, that was amended because now, because US citizens could even be surveilled if they were communicating from abroad. Now there was an amendment <coughs> where no, not even being abroad, US citizens cannot fall under surveillance unless there is a court order. Well, yes, this is great. But what happens if a US citizen is communicating with a foreigner? Because that's, that's the typical case. I mean, you may have a friend in Europe, or you studied with someone there, and you communicate. Or what if you were doing human rights in Pakistan, and you went to follow up with them, and, and with NGOs over there? Or, I mean, it's not such a simple thing. It probably works well in terms of a press sort of quote in the US. Because when I discovered that only, I think, 7% of the population in the US have passports means that most of the population in the US don't travel abroad. But, so it'll make a lot of people happy in the US to know that their communications inside are not being monitored. But for those 7% that have traveled, or will travel, or planning to travel, I'm sure it won't. Because I think, number one, is this, this is an issue with everyone. 
But more importantly is the question of why do we have human rights to begin with? And we have human rights because we came out of the Second World War with the idea that the atrocities that were committed abroad, that were committed by the Axis countries, by Germany, Italy, and Japan, should never happen again. So we were trying to create this basic bottom line standard, like this minimal standard. Now, the only way it works is if we all agree that this is a worldwide consensus. So if we break the consensus, we are weakening the whole concept of human rights ourselves. And I think this is what's happening with communications. By the way, it also happens with the use of torture and the, uh, a couple of other issues that are not in my mandate, which I didn't get into because of that. But, but I think it, it is important to go back to the debate of universality. And I agree, fully agree with you. It makes it untenable to talk about privacy if everyone doesn't have it, then how can we guarantee it even here? Just follow up on, on Cynthia's question um, and maybe put an even blunter point on it, um, <laughs> as is my want. Um, I, I mean, what we really have here is a clash between sort of U.S., the application of U.S. constitutional law, which protects American citizens who are, who are holding the American government accountable. Um, a, a, a conflict between that and international human rights law uh, under which all human beings should enjoy the same protections everywhere on the planet. Um, and, you know, this con conflicting with a, a, a sort of a, a, an interpretation of the Constitution that only applies uh, to American citizens, which is, or residents, which is, you know, problematic. And so when when we have a situation, I mean, there's those of us in human rights, you know, talk a lot about you know conflicts between nation state domestic law and international human rights law, oftentimes in the context of authoritarian regimes. But you know, here we are. Uh, and what do we do? Um, what do we do about this going forward? Um, how do do we need? I mean, obviously, kind of going to the UN or the ITU and getting all the nation states to come together and coordinate their laws so that they're all going to be uh, uh, you know, consistent with international human rights standards, you know, this strikes me as, as perhaps an, an unlikely thing that would happen. And we all have lots of problems with the, the UN and internet governance anyway. So what do we do going forward? Um, how do we get at least, at least those countries which have made public commitments to internet freedom, have created something called the Freedom Online Coalition, where they've all gotten together and claimed that they uphold internet freedom. It's very clear, not only from your report, but from the work of the broader human rights community for a number of years, that privacy and freedom of expression go hand in hand, and you cannot have internet freedom with unaccountable surveillance going on. I mean, this, it's pretty clear that that is a fact. <laughs> I, I mean, if, if you believe in internet, in, in, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and, 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 and the Associated Covenants. So given that that's the case, how, how do we move forward? How do citizens of democracies whose governments have made these commitments um, get our governments to actually adhere to them? Yeah, it, 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 you're, you're raising a crucial question that we deal with all the time in, in, at the Human Rights Council in, in the UN in general. And, and by the way, I'm not pretending to think that the UN is this great, wonderful, effective institution. By no means. Don't take my words on that. It's, it's, it's what we got. It's a, the Global World Forum. So we must have, might as well use it and use it well. Um, I, I even have a couple of anecdotes of how weak the, the UN may be. But interestingly enough, the, the constitutional question is important because it is true that there is a role for constitutional law in every country of the world and that human rights are the minimum standards that all countries should have, but that can be increased by their own constitution. And this is the role of constitutional law. Is to, number one is to adopt basic human rights standards in every country. And number two is to actually make them better. Now, when I mention this to some countries, they even laugh at me. And they said, I mean, we don't, just by mentioning cases like death penalty, for instance, when in general, 
people in the UN recognize that that is uh, giving the right to take life to the state is in retrospect something that should not exist. But yes, that may be a worldwide consensus, but many countries don't want to accept that. So the idea is that constitutions should be built on the uh, basis of human rights standards. And secondly, there is an obligation of all states to make their internal, their domestic legislation in coherence with international standards. And that is one of the most difficult issues that I find. To tell you the truth, I mean, we're looking at processes going backward in, on freedom of expression, which is what obviously I follow. Hungary just passed laws that are a huge setback in terms of freedom of expression of their own people internally. Not even foreigners, but even domestically. Um, Ecuador just passed a law where they talk about uh, media lynching um, or, or, or they create a superintendent of communication, which is really a censorship authority. So no matter where we look at uh, in different countries, we are looking at setbacks in legislation instead of moving forward in legislation and actually using the human rights standards to improve. Some countries are putting in more restrictive and restrictive legislation. Now, th th this is a trend in the world, by the way. It's not only, iso I mean, I mentioned some isolated cases because I'm kind of shocked at the fact that these are happening. But, but the fact of the matter is that I think internet did bring one issue about, which is the fear of political leaders. And especially after the Arab Spring, regardless of what the final outcome will be in the region. But, it did prove to many political leaders that communication is powerful. And citizens moving now with their own forms of communication are very powerful. But that should be seen as something positive because I, I mentioned in my report that internet facilitates citizen participation, which is what a democracy wants. But lo and behold, it seems to me that many political leaders around the world are scared about citizen participation. They used to talk about that, but they really didn't want it too much. Because now that people can actually have electronic government and transparency in, in, a, in, in your fingertips, can actually criticize public policies or public officials, then they're all scared. So the legislation in the world in general, in different degrees, is moving to more rigorous control. And this is what I find unacceptable, at least certainly not by the executive branch of any, of any country. So clearly, yes, we must maintain constitutional order everywhere to guarantee democracy, but constitutional order must be seen as something going above human rights standards and never going below, which is not necessarily the case. I mean, there are many constitutions. Um, we could mention from gender issues and gender equity to treatment of children, many constitutions that don't guarantee equality of rights uh, of, of all its people in, in the territory. So <clears throat> I want to actually make an invitation now, right? Um, so first I would like to know uh, from the folks here, who is a non-American? A non-American, a non-born non here. What if you have dual citizenship? <laughs> <laughs> you are half Brazilian, Sasha. So uh, can you please put your hands up? So first I want to thank you to be here with me. And I want to thank you the opportunity to be here with this panel, but I want us to invert a little bit the, ra the rationale of our conversation. So if you think that we are all non-Americans, you guys are all non-Brazilians, all non-Germans, all non-Chinese, right? And I want us to think about the consequences of the US acts in terms of legitimating a domino effect of increasing surveillance in non countries, in non US, in, in other countries, right? So I come from Brazil and I'm working on legislation there for many years, from more than 12 years in this area. So we probably guys heard about the Internet Bill of Rights in Brazil. After this, that is stuck. Uh, you guys may have heard about net neutrality legislation coming from Argentina. After this, that stuck. So we have to really think about many topics here, and I have many others in my mind, right? We have to think about the, consequence, the consequences of that in terms of global geopolitics, but also national geopolitics, right? And I think in the middle of all of that is the word trust. 
right? So I'm putting this to you because I would love to hear Frank talking about this, but also my colleagues Rebecca and Cynthia. Uh, you see, uh, if you, we did some mapping on some of the reactions around the world here uh, with Gene's team, um, which I'm part of, and we see reactions from Switzerland, we see reactions from EU, we see reactions from Brazil, we see reactions from China. Uh, we see a very different geopolitics internet governance that we have been seeing in other topics, right? And these folks are pressuring for something that we all have been fighting, that is the oversight by ITU, for example. So I think we need to understand the domino effect and the risk, right? So Brazil and US have the Global Partnership Program on Government Transparency. The trust on that program is also very uh, shaken right now, right? So I want to hear from you, like, let's take out the focus. Oh, but by the way, right, US is a land of immigrants, right? So besides the folks not traveling abroad, you do have family abroad, right? So I want us turning the table and thinking from the side of the non-American. What does that mean geopolitically? And what, what are the risks we're going to see in other countries that will feel legitimate to do this, right? Mercosur, the Cone South uh, 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 group, is thinking of co-location regulation, right? So what we see now and what we should do? What is the oversight? What is the judicial and legislative oversight we should have to deal with that? The, the, there's a couple of things that come that, that, that come to mind in terms of what the effect of this, of this Snowden and all these scandals will be in the Britain, the G8 and all this is that I think it's a major setback. The, clearly the countries that originate the technology, which are the US and Europe, are the countries that have the lead on internet. And many other countries add elements of technology, but if the leading technological countries are actually engaging in developing new technologies for monitoring without any supervision, monitoring that makes it easy to jump any ju judiciary oversight or, or legislative oversight, then it clearly creates a bad example. Because then what can you say, like you said, to any other country around the world who may not have the new de technological developments from their own investigation, but can buy this technological development, which, by the way, brings me to another point that I mentioned in my report, is that there is a responsibility of states in this, but there's also an element of corporate responsibility. Mm -hmm. Because many countries are buying this technology for compor corporations, corporations that come initially from a democratic society, but who have no problem in selling it to the government of Syria, for instance to monitor what's happening or what communications are, are, are occurring there or, or to North Korea. Uh, and, and I think this is a very serious issue that is being brought about. Um, I would like to engage, and I have mentioned this to friends in different uh, uh, corporations that deal with, with ITs, that this is the right moment to have a serious sort of uh, moral, ethical uh, standard issues in terms of corporations. In, even in my report, we go as far as to say the same way you have export licenses for weapons facilities that some countries would control, there should be some form of export licenses for this type of technology as well to at least generate some degree of image of some control. Now, the opposing view to that, what people told me, is that you can always monitor weapons when they're being exported. You cannot necessarily monitor uh, communications technology or, or, or internet technology when it's, you can't monitor software when it's being sent to someone else. But I think that you, you can eventually find out where the origin was. And for me, this is an important point. If a corporation registered in a particular country is exporting this technology, there should be some form of notification and authorization to the state because of the sensitive nature of this. But beyond that, the fact is that already this scandal has created a tremendous impact in terms of who responds to whom and where do you establish the legal standards. And ironically, as I was saying, I don't agree with the ITU being the governance body of internet because what the, some countries that are pushing it to the ITU, what they're trying to do is just simply to reproduce the vote of the General Assembly. So yes, you will have the vote of all these countries that don't necessarily produce the technology and don't necessarily have the most democratic forms of government. That is not exactly what you want in the internet. You don't want the control of those that are powerful either. 
and just the control of the powerful, but you clearly don't want a simple control by vote. Internet has to flow in a different way, it has to be a more multi-stakeholder type issue, which is what we have been dealing with at the IGF and other forums before, but with no easy solution. But the precedents being set now, which was your question, I think are very bad. And I think are stopping programs. Uh, I don't even know if the Ley de Marco Civil was approved in, in, in Brazil at the end or not. But, but for instance, it was. So the idea is that this issue will provoke a setback in many countries in terms of what could have been a more progressive and open-minded approach to, to internet issues around the world. Just to pull together some threads here, I mean, Rebecca, uh, Rebecca brought up the Freedom, On Coalition, Freedom Online Coalition, which is a coalition of about 20 governments. The goal really was to bring together a much broader base of governments in support of the idea that human rights apply as much online and offline, right? So it's to, to build a broader base of governments that support that notion. Um, fast forward to today, um, we have two governments who are, who are I incredibly, um, increasingly afraid of the power of social media, right? So Turkey. The past few weeks have shown um, that the government has become very hostile to social media and they're now talking about how can we force internet companies to hand over user data more readily in our country and what regulations do we need. And then in April, India started rolling out a, a huge centralized monitoring system that would allow direct monitoring of both telephone and internet networks. It's really hard for me to imagine now that the leaders of the Freedom Online Coalition being able to push back against some of these more problematic trends now. And I think that's one of the biggest issues that we really need to grapple with in terms of the, the precedent we've really set. I just feel like in a lot of ways, governments are going to look at what the UK and the US are supposedly doing and saying, look, there's a roadmap for what I can do if I want to better monitor social media and better monitor the internet in my country. And, and I'm not entirely sure what the answer is um, to Rebecca's first question to all that. And just to add to that, and even Brazil, right, that is democratic, uh, the, the, the Dilma pronounced last, not this Sunday, the last, this Sunday before that, that she want to do the same, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so everybody leaves the room screaming, we need to do something, and the first thing that needs to be done is more control. And this is terrifying for us Brazilians because we are still fighting to open up archives from the dictatorship period, right? When until I was five, we had that. So. How are we going to deal with that? Yeah, I mean, just speaking to this issue of, of international reaction, um, I'm co-founder of something called Global Voices Online, which is an international bloggers network. Uh, and uh, I can tell you, you know, people are really concerned about the way in which their governments are taking advantage exactly. Of, exactly. Of, of the moment. Yeah. Of the moment. You know, Russia, you're saying, OK, well, n now we need to de demand the same access of foreign <laughs> operators that the, that the U.S. is demanding. Um, and, and, and a lot of concern also about cynicism, not, not just in authoritarian countries, but, but concern in Europe that, that European country governments are sort of going on the high horse uh, about, oh, you know, the U.S. is doing all these bad things. We must therefore kind of create, protect our own industry and, you know, have our own parallel structures, yet they, most of these governments, too, are, you know, one can list a number of very problematic surveillance-related uh, developments going on in, in a lot of European countries, or proposed laws, et cetera. Uh, and, and so concern that the Internet is going to get balkanized, kind of, uh, you know, and that this is going to be an excuse for governments to actually obtain more control uh, over national networks. Um, that's that's not going to ultimately benefit citizens. Yes. Um, although there is some hope, I think, in some quarters in Europe that that they're uh, at least on privacy laws and some privacy standards and protection, data protection, that that there this might be a moment to push for for a bit more rigor in that regard and and weaken some of the corporate lobbies that have been trying to water down um, uh, data protection laws in Europe, which kind of speaks to, brings us to the, the corporate accountability piece that, uh, that, I, I, that Frank raised that's really <coughs> important that, that I'd love to kind of emphasize, uh, which is, you know, Egyptian activists will point out uh, that the technology used in Egypt to monitor activists was produced by NARUS, which, was owned, which is owned by Boeing, which we learned from whistleblowers long before Snowden 
uh, was being used and probably still being used by AT&T in the NSA secret room in, in its facility, facilities in a number of, of um, places around this country. Um, and, and, you know, this, this is an issue that you have a kind of a surveillance <laughs> industrial complex that is developing technologies for our government agencies, and then they're selling those technologies around the world uh, in, in a way that is deeply troubling, completely unaccountable, unregulated in any way. Uh, but, but going beyond those types of technologies that kind of, you know, the end user is a government agency, but just as consumer technologies, right? So there, there's an issue around, you know, a broader corporate accountability, which we've got three people here from the Global Network Initiative, or four people today, um, and, and so hopefully we'll be able to hear from them directly. But, you know, maybe you can control Naris's technologies going to Egypt, but can you control Telia Sonera selling mobile phone network equipment to Azerbaijan, and do you want to, right? And, but at the same time, you know, it, it was found by investigative journalists that Telia Sonera played a role in the fact that people were questioned by police after they sent text messages voting for Armenian singers in the Eurovision contest, you know. And, and, and so, you know, that, that, that companies are being found you know, companies that, you know, or, and there's been a lot of issues around BlackBerry and, you know, a whole range of, of different companies um, uh, that, that have been acquiescing to government demands, you know, surveillance demands. And uh, a lot of questions of are these companies doing everything they can with, within the context of these, you know, imperfect legal and political situations they're, they're operating in to, to, mitigate harm to make sure that their users and customers understand what's being collected, what's being shared with whom, so their users and customers can make more informed choices uh, about how and whether they're going to use certain services. Uh, and, you know, the Global Network Initiative has done great work on developing free expression and privacy standards for companies and implementation guidelines. Uh, the UN uh, guiding principles on business and human rights make it very clear you know, which, which governments and, and, you know, have, have signed on to, um, it, it make, it, make it very clear that, that companies do have human rights obligations. It's not just business is business is business, you know, um, just as they have obligations to the environment and labor and so on, they, they, they have obligations when it comes to human rights related to free expression and privacy, and that companies need to take that seriously. They need to be held accountable, and they need to make that commitment. And, you know, just we need to move forward in some kind of, as you were saying, sort of multi-stakeholder process that involves companies making commitments, gov governments making commitments, and civil society really holding everybody's feet to the fire. Uh, but the question is how we get that started when even, you know, my own government and a number of others who are leaders of the Freedom Online Coalition obviously have, have trouble kind of being leaders on this particular issue. Maybe w one of the things that worries me is that I, I have no doubt that many governments were already monitoring. The technology sure. is so good. And we knew and, that. And we knew that. Yeah, it just, um, yeah. the, the problem is that we're, we're moving into areas of cynicism now where if the U.S. is doing it, then we should all do it and we should do it openly and we should also enact legislation that legitimizes what we're doing. So it, th there is a trend to make a bad situation worse. I'm not, because it was being done before, but at least it was considered illegal. If you were found, it, was, it would be criticized, it was illegal. But now, now it all of a sudden becomes, if, if you feel threatened and your national security threatened, then it, it, it feels legitimate. Uh, the other day I heard a program on television, which I thought was very interesting, is, is issues of national security are real, and terrorism is clearly a threat in the world. But if you look at the amount of people that die out of predictable disease or, or, or infections, and the investment that should be done into preventing those deaths, and look at what is being invested in anti-terrorism, there's a total disproportion there. So. 
is it really the right to life that is being defended? I mean, is really people concerned about defending the citizens? I mean, because if that were the case, there would be much more investment in health and preventive uh, uh, mechanisms. And maybe finally on the question of corporations. The, the, the other issue I raise in my report, by the way, is that there's also the question of surveillance for commercial reasons. And that is even very preoccupying. Yes, profiling can be done politically because you, there's some people that seen as a threat, but profiling is also being done for commercial reasons. I have a friend, uh, friends from, the, uh, from South Africa, um, Henriette, who was telling me that she put her photograph in, in Facebook and she never, she happens to be on the heavy side and she began receiving all these ads of diets and, and uh, lose weight drinks and she never requested any of that. She had never subscribed to anything of that. So clearly someone just by looking at her photo decided that this may be what she wanted to buy. So this is terrible. I mean, this is, this is really the commercial use of data banks that any corporation can just sell off. This linked to the famous clouding, which I think is also a fiction because that generates a, the, 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 the sense that is, that is neutral territory, is extraterritoriality, which doesn't exist because it is in the control of someone, a corporation which is going to be based somewhere anyway. Then we have to break all these sort of false myths being used with the consumers or the users of, of internet uh, service providers. So I think that th these are the challenges of today in terms of the surveillance and monitoring. I think we have to build a question of transparency into that and certainly go back to the regulations of protection. And this was essentially what I said, not to eliminate monitoring. I say in my report, monitoring can be done if it's done legally and properly, but to limit it to the real extreme necessity cases. Can I actually, just one footnote to the last two points, which is I think another um, major fallout from this is that uh, we're members of the Global Network Initiative, and we've done a lot of work in pressing internet companies to resist government requests for user data um, because it can have such harmful outcomes, right? If, if internet activists are identified and are put in jail, um, that's a real harmful outcome, and, and companies do have a responsibility there. Um, I think this is going to make it much more difficult for companies all around the world to push back against government requests for user data, especially over broad ones, right? If they're seen as completely complicit in massive surveillance uh, in, in privacy infringements in the US, how can they say with a straight face to other governments, no, we won't do for you what we're doing for the US? And I think that's another thing that we're getting to grapple with, both as the human rights movement and, and the companies themselves. And I think at least one first step in all this, which I think both of you have already mentioned, is um, transparency and a lot more disclosure over what's actually happening so we can have a rational debate about it. So I want to um, uh, open this up for the audience, uh, those online as well. There's a microphone in the back. Let me start off though um, as we prepare. Frank, you've, um, you've suggested uh, constitutional standards, legal standards that are above the minimum human rights standard. And uh, we know in this country there's a, a very heated debate about the Fourth Amendment, about the Patriot Act. Um, how do you think, does the world paying attention to that? Does it matter to the world? What do you think the image from the outside is? That's uh, um, not a difficult question, but a sensitive question. But, but uh, in a very direct answer, Jim, <clears throat> I think there are some countries that for good or bad are being monitored constantly by the world. And clearly the US is one of them. And whatever happens in the US generates a trend and it can be a positive trend. Like I said, I think the First Amendment, although goes beyond what many of us would accept, has been, I think, very positive because it put the standard very high and that was very good. But the same way, I think, the, whenever the US does something that challenges principles of human rights, it has a very negative effect. This has been pointed out by, by several rapporteurs. Uh, Philip Alston did it with the use of drones and Christoph Heinz now, or, or Juan Mendes now with the use of torture. Um, and I have now said it was the use of surveillance, of technical surveillance. I mean, not referring specifically to like this incident, like I said, because this happened after my report, but. But essentially, I think, yes, uh, typically, 
whatever happens, in, especially in <clears throat> some countries, in the big countries of Europe, and in the US and Canada, will always have an impact in terms of what happens in the rest of the world. And, and in this case, very tragically, a very negative effect. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank you so much, Jean, for organizing this. Uh, my name is Susan Aronson. I work with the World Wide Web Foundation. I'm a professor at GWU. And what we're trying to do is to monitor, uh, excuse me, to measure over time government's adherence to internet freedom and openness. Pretty hard to do. We're going to do it by surveying, though. Um, I wanted to ask you, though, about a different tactic, if you will. Um, clearly, governments, including my own government, are really struggling to balance various rights. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're not new to these rights, but the balance is new, right? Because the internet is so new. So the US, on one hand, is great giving all this money to New America and others and trying to empower people to be able to use the internet, right, with Tor, et cetera. And the US is terrible in its own balance. So what I would suggest to you is, is there any way you could spell out and obviously, what's right for Kenya is going to be different from what's right for the United States, let alone China. But is there any way you can spell out how nations can balance, for example, privacy and surveillance, um, uh, the right to privacy and intellectual property rights? Um, so you deal with Hadopi law, et cetera. Could you talk a little bit about how you might describe a roadmap for, com for countries, instead of saying these are the rights and this is what governments are doing, maybe spell out here's how you can find the right balance. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I understand what you're saying about the roadmap. And, should I? Uh -huh. and I, I would, um, and, and I like the idea of trying to be, put it on the positive side. I, I wouldn't use the word balance. Um, I don't think one balances, uh, I think privacy is a given and we should have it all the time and the, the times when we lose it is for exceptional reasons that have to be clearly identified. One of the issues that I'm struggling for my next report, which is access to public information regarding human rights violations and the right to truth, is what happens I mean, every victim has a right to request information when the rights are being violated. But what happens when there's a leak? <laughs> and is there any liability? And in which cases is there a liability which is not? Which deals with many of these other cases that we're now handling because many of them were leaks in terms of the information. And my position is that there the balance has to be, or the balance or the definition has to be in whether there is a harm or a benefit in, in the leak. Um, here again, the point I'm making with privacy is <laughs> privacy exists for a reason, which is to protect freedom of expression. We want to be able to be free to say what we want to say because only the person we're speaking to or, or sending the message or several people should be those that are reading it. And this is what allows us to speak freely. Now, if we lose that privacy or part of that privacy, then we're also losing freedom of expression. This is why I say they're two different rights, but they really very much go hand in hand. And in countries where you risk your life, like or, 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 your, or your freedom, like in, in Thailand there was this old man who, 80 years old, literally, and was sentenced to 20 years in prison because he had four messages criticizing the king, and you get five years per statement, and he did four. So he got 20 years in prison for, for, for SMS messages uh, criticizing the king. This is absurd. So someone was obviously monitoring these communications. So here's where I, uh, again, I, I don't find an easy solution because I don't think there's a balance. I think human rights have to exist, period. This is the principle of human rights. This is why I keep on insisting that they're minimal, that they can't be different in Nigeria than they are in the US. Or they cannot be different in Kenya, or they cannot be different in, in, in uh, Bangladesh. They have to be the same. If we were talking about cultural, sophisticated issues, yes, cultures can be different, traditions, values can be different. But there has to be sort of a minimum network of protection of the bottom line. And I think this is where the mentality of human rights have to move into looking at human rights as the minimum, as the bottom floor, and not as a maximum.
So now, Frank, that I see tremendous interest in you, I'm going to ask if we can actually get a number of questions raised and see whether they create a theme. So why don't we, we have two or three right here. Uh, hi, I'm Susan Morgan. I run the Global Network Initiative, which has been mentioned a few times. Um, I want to ask you about, it seems to me that what we need to have is an entirely different conversation about free expression, privacy, and national security and surveillance. And I, my observation would be that we're struggling to even work out how to have the conversation. You know, I, I see discussions happening entirely in parallel. So there are meetings like the one today, which will be very much focused on the kind of free flow of information, um, free expression and privacy. And then, you know, probably in other parts of Washington at the same time, there's conversations happening about the importance of surveillance and, and national security. Um, and I know from the work that we've done in GNI over the last few years, it's incredibly hard to even get the people in the same room together. But it strikes me that that's a prerequisite for the kind of conversations that we need to be having. Um, and I just wondered if you have any thoughts on how we might make that happen. So let's do a few more questions here, and then we'll go back to... Take up a, a slightly different issue, German Brooks, also from the Global Network Initiative, uh, and a non-US non citizen. Um, I, I'm just wondering, how do you get governments uh, to take seriously the kind of advocacy statements which are coming from uh, the NGO community, from uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives like, like GNI? In other words, how do we move governments, and above all, because it is uh, basically a U.S. problem, how do we move the U.S. government, and why is it above all a U.S. problem? Because most of the information is either stored in the U.S., or uh, passes through the US or through US controlled entities. So that, that has got the rest of the world very upset. And I spend a lot of my time in Germany uh, where there's a huge focus on uh, privacy of information. And there's a lot of discussion about, well, how about creating our own uh, ISPs, our own internet companies? And I think, why couldn't the, uh, the general consensus coming also from the companies uh, but supported by many others in the US, uh, try to influence the government as saying what you're actually doing is you're damaging the predominant um, international position of uh, a high technology leadership position of this country. Uh, and uh, unless you can curtail some of the impacts of the legislation or lack of control over that legislation, then you won't be successful uh, and gradually the dominance of the U.S. Uh, technology leaders will, will be diminished worldwide. And perhaps because uh, of the nature of the U.S., uh, with its openness to uh, business success, that, that particular argument might be stronger in political circles than any of the arguments coming from the uh, typical civil society source. So we have one more right behind you, and then we'll turn back to Frank. Hi, I'm George Lyle from Internews. And, uh, my question is this, we talk about the dangers of surveillance, and is the problem access to the equipment or the attitudes while using it? Because now, for example, your uh, example about the gentleman in Thailand, uh, states can go out looking for crime. They can just set the controls on the system and set it to alert them anytime somebody does something wrong. Frank, did you wanna? Uh -huh. Fresh um, response? I like this idea that, that Susan was proposing of, of let, let's think of a new approach. And I've been thinking of that very specifically. For instance, what about having a meeting with security agencies? I mean, because I normally meet with human rights groups, and then it turns out into being a great conversation. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not sure the governments are, are, are paying attention. And, and obviously, my, I do it because my role as rapporteur is to strengthen civil society and human rights organizations. And fine, I'll, I'll keep on doing that. But I would certainly enjoy, I, I would love, I, I was telling a friend of mine uh, who works, there were several friends who work at state, they would really enjoy having a conversation with President Obama one day and to look at the issues from his perspective and say, okay, I understand you're worried about national security. Of course, you're the president. and and you will carry the weight of whatever happens, whether it be small or big, 
and whether the press makes it big or small. I mean, and certain issues should not, this is against deals was also the response to ethics, professional ethics of the press, of issues that should not be made big which, because they're not really like the pastor burning the Quran in Florida, for instance, which was a non-issue to begin with and should have never become an issue. Um, so I understand he must have all this weight on his shoulders. But it would be interesting to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation saying, okay, what about having a different approach? What about calling on your own people, on the U.S. people, to really have a campaign, a national campaign for human rights, guaranteeing security from a human rights perspective? I'm not saying the U.S. should be weak at all, no, nor any country by that matter. I mean, I think all countries should feel strong, but should feel strong making their democratic model stronger and not weaken democratic principles and, and, and democratic models. And this would be great. So I've been thinking of actually trying to see I don't count on the UN too much, I mean, to, to do these things, because the UN always gets scared, you know. Um, but, but I've been thinking of getting, like, why don't we get a couple of intelligence agencies, the big ones, together? From the US, Russia, Britain, China, or India, or Brazil, and, and some of the, the big ones, and say, okay, let's have a conversation. You want to guarantee national security? Okay. Why don't you do it, why don't you do it well, but within the boundaries of the law? Why don't you establish a system that actually works? We hope this conversation is multi-stakeholder because... A multi-stakeholder, <laughs> yes. Know, yeah, every yeah. people trust their own security agencies, right? So there is a... And, and the same thing happens with, with governments. I mean, I, I think Cynthia was making... Uh, um, Cynthia Wong was making a very important point with the, with the Freedom Online Coalition. Because the Freedom Online Coalition began as a strong movement of states, and I, I like that. I, I like the idea that these were states getting together to promote freedom on the, on the network. But all of a sudden, even those that began, like Turkey, are now having, are, are, are getting cold turkey. Um, so, so, I mean, they're, they're getting cold feet on it. And, and because they had a protest in, in the square, well, the, 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 there is always the sense in politicians that they want to control things, and yes, they want to, exactly. and the, the idea of control means monitoring. But again, I think this is the, the idea of breaking the model of just speaking amongst ourselves. I think is important, and and I would take that very very seriously. I think we should do a dialogue with security agencies. We should do a dialogue with with. Uh, Foreign ministries, which are the, what works in the UN, are not necessarily those that make the decisions in the country, so they're probably not the best interlocutors. I think it should not be the foreign ministries. I think they should be the interior ministries or the security agencies or the military uh, where we could have this type of conversation. And I think we've had conversations on human rights with these type of agencies anyway on other issues, not necessarily on communication, but, but I think this would be a moment to try this out. And certainly with governments, what is the reputation? I, keep, I had a, a, a big discussion with President Correa, to not mention names, of Ecuador. And he was saying, look, I'm being attacked by the press. This was on freedom of the press. So I have to be able to, to limit the lies, they say. And I said, you, you seem to be a smart guy, I said. And, and I imagine that with the very flamboyant character, with the charisma you have, I said, you want to transcend in history in your own country. How do you want to be remembered? And for the first time, I saw him sit back. Because the way you're going, I said, you're going to be remembered as the president who censored the press. So we're not going to remember you as a guy who had good ideas and was very progressive. No. You were the, the, the very irate president who got annoyed of any criticism and who, who was using defamation charges and who was closing newspapers. And this is what people are going to remember, I said. And this is going to be your legacy. To many political leaders, it would be interesting to see that, to say, how will Mubarak be remembered in Egypt I mean, after 30 years in, in power? So anyway, yes, the answer, Susan, is yes, we have to look at different venues and different conversations. And let's build other circles to bring this about. The message would be the same one, though. The message is we have human rights as a worldwide consensus because we believe in it. And if, if, if the world is apparently losing interest, then, then we're in a real crisis. No? But the thing is that we believe in it because we want to have certain basic world order around respect for human life and dignity and, and, and minimal standards. Um, let me see. In the, in the, um, 
the second question on the um, uh, how do we get governments to have interest? A little bit like I was saying now. We get governments to have interest by actually proving that it is important for them. I'm not sure about the commercial message. I have, yes, it is important to be competitive and to be effective commercially, but one of the reasons I think we have lost track of some issues that there is an excessively commercial issue. There are things that can't be valued commercially. This is happening for me specifically with the press. There is an excessively commercial perspective, so a lot of the press is going after the news that sells, and I find that very difficult. And I would like to believe, and ethics this is not always a commercially profitable, but it's very important for a corporation if they can actually prove that they have a transparent uh, way of, of thinking. Um, in some cases, yes, you can do consumer advocacy uh, with some issues. But for instance, there, this would be interesting with some of the social networks. Are they keeping that information? Are they selling their databases? Are they notifying the users, as Cindy had mentioned, what they're doing with that information? I think some of that could come from user campaigns and, and, and protection of consumers, yes, of, of the services. But I think also there has to be other pressures. And I think here's where we have to persuade the governments of those countries to have, like I said, the export licenses for certain materials which are particularly dangerous in terms of the type of software and the type of, of, of uh, that can be done. No? I know Rebecca wants back in. I want to make sure others, if you please let the, uh, let us know if you have questions out there quickly, Rebecca. Just, just quickly, um, I would really like to see the internet industry put as many resources into changing the law here in the United States uh, around unaccountable surveillance, reforming the Patriot Act, reforming FISA Re Amendments Act, and so on, as they put into fighting the SOPA and PIPA um, at, at the beginning of 2012. Um, also, I'd note, I've, I'd, I see that there's a, a few government folks in, in the audience and, and a couple of, of, of company people and quite a lot of, but I don't see anybody from the national security side of things. We wouldn't let you see We that. never know. <laughs> I, have, I will make sure I'm on the, I teach the war college as well, so I'm on the list and I will make sure that you have a website so that all those people know about it. We, we will get it to you soon. Thank you. A webcast for the War College. I'm Tim Lieber from uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, one question I had that came up really early on, you said states have only a right but a responsibility to defend their national security and defend their citizens. And I was wondering, does that extend to defending their citizens from surveillance, uh, especially from other states? Uh, and I was wondering if that can reframe the conversation from telling the NSA not to spy to, as a sovereign government, should I find a way to make sure my citizens are safe? Hi, my name is Adriana Benedict and I'm with Public Citizens Global Access to Medicines Program. Uh, one area of our work involves uh, working as a civil society stakeholder in free trade agreement negotiations. Um, and as I'm sure you know, uh, these agreements impose rigid supranational laws on countries um, that extend to many areas of internet freedom, including telecommunications and intellectual property. Um, and I have two Two questions um, today. First, how should human rights obligations interact with these agreements? And to what extent can a human rights dialogue surrounding these negotiations ensure that countries like the US are prepared to establish and abide by robust standards concerning internet privacy? And how do you think that an environment of compromised trust figures into government's abilities to negotiate binding trade agreements such as the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which, for instance, are likely to seek broad internet uh, service provider liability? Yeah. <laughs> there was one question from before that we had, that I, we had left, which was, is, is it equipment or is it the policies? I would say, it, 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 in reality, it's the policies. But, but also, the fact of the matter is that you have some countries that are, have a history of being more abusive of their 
citizens, over the rights of people. So you also bring in the question of equipment because you certainly don't want the, the, the equipment to get into their hands. So again, just to, to summarize it, I would say is the policies because I mean the policy of the government should be to respect basic rights including privacy and to monitor when monitoring is necessary but using the law, using the, the, the justice system uh, and, and not jumping all the, all the procedures. Uh, but again, I would make the point that equipment, you don't want, I mean, you would doubt twice to sell equipment to North Korea, even if you didn't know in detail what their policy on surveillance was. I mean, you would clearly have your doubts about selling monitoring equipment to them. So I think both of the issues would, would fall in hand in hand. Um, yeah. Uh, The, um, the, I think it's a great question um, whether the obligation to protect its citizens includes um, protecting their basic human rights, including privacy. Uh, yes, I mean, obviously the answer is yes. But many states would probably think that their obligation, their first obligation is to protect their physical integrity and their physical safety. And I understand that. I mean, this is what, what challenges people the most. And, and if I say this because, I mean, I don't, again, I don't want to reduce the importance of terrorism. Terrorism goes by, state, by waves in, in the history of the world. And we are in an increasing period. And it is a real risk. So um, I understand states being worried about terrorist acts. But the problem is that, number one, is you can't do away with everything else and say, I'm going to protect my citizens from terrorism and in the meantime become an undemocratic government, an authoritarian government. And certainly, you cannot use terrorism yourself, uh, which is what other, uh, I mean, authoritarian nations actually do to others. I mean, yes, the life of my citizens I have to protect, but the life of others I can sort of eliminate or forget. This is a very dangerous proposition because it's a, it again breaks the universality of human rights. It's an anti-human rights uh, question. So what we talk about in protecting citizens is you're not only protecting the individuals, you're protecting the democratic model of society you wanted to establish. And protecting that democratic model means that you want to protect human rights. I always say that the respect for human rights is the measure of democracy, the ultimate measure of democracy. Ah, trade agreements. Yes, very important. I think human rights should be brought in. Uh, a long time ago, I used to follow some with the USTR, some of the trade agreements and labor standards. And, and, and yes, labor standards were brought in so as not to provoke a sort of uh, unlawful or undesired competition. But I think human rights should should be equally important. There should be certainly human rights, clear human rights standards brought into play when signing trade agreements with other countries. One of the questions is the intellectual property issue is what sort of brings a little bit of a cloud into all this. Because although I believe in intellectual property, I think people should have a right to protect their creation. Uh, it oftentimes is perceived as was SOPA and PIPA legitimately that they go overboard. I mean, the legislation protecting intellectual property is certainly so aggressive that it actually stifles uh, freedom of expression and the use of internet. And this is dangerous. There has to be, there I can use the word balance, there has to be a balance. There has to be a protection for intellectual property, but it ha doesn't have to be so aggressive or go too far, because otherwise you will generate what's already happening, for instance, in Sweden. You now have the Pirate Party, officially, called that way, with two members in the European Parliament whose only topic of agenda is net neutrality, that anything on the net is everyone's property and then no one can actually consider it theirs. Now, I mean, this may be seen as extreme, but I think it's the reaction to excessive uh, attempts to protect intellectual property. 
I just want to add on the trade agreement issue, and I think linked to the previous question, right? One of the topics there is information flow, uh, in general under e-commerce chapters, not in the uh, IP chapter there, there is ISP liability and other issues. And I think I've been talking to some companies and also uh, with folks in the government, that can be a shot in US on foot, right? Uh, that has been some of the most controversial provisions in those trade agreements, which has actually blocked some of the chapters to move forward in the TPP for a while. So uh, if internet is really one of the most growing uh, sectors in US, uh, sh should we be paying more attention on how these revelations affect uh, companies? In Brazil, for example, Ivo Correa, who was the head of Google policy, is being, which now is in the government, is being called the spy of Google in the government, right? So you have a lot of implications that uh, we need to think in, in many forums. So um, because we're going to need to wrap up, the room is moving on to another discussion. I need to um, end this now. I want to thank you, Frank, and our panelists. I think you've brought the Universal Declaration of Human Rights into a U.S. discussion where it often doesn't reside. So we thank you very much for thank taking you this much. time. Yes. And thank all of you in the audience for coming.